without belaboring the point, I just wanted to say that we are so grateful for all that was done in Equip this year. You have embraced uh, this uh, event, this workshop, and we are excited to be able to continue that next year. We're going to be looking at Isaiah, as you saw. The dates are going to change April 24th through 27th uh, of next year. And it's going to be, of course, the Lord willing, uh, the new facility at Cumberland Trace. So I said that now so that you can go ahead and mark off time from work and mark off time from school and be there with us uh, as we explore this great theme uh, looking at the prophets is very beneficial for us to understand what God's will for us is in the church. And to that end, I'm going to look at a different one of those prophets tonight. Have you ever gotten into an argument with your spouse? I'm talking, of course you have, but I'm talking about a special kind of argument. This is the kind of argument where both of you lose your temper. And it's so bad you can't get it reconciled. And when you depart from each other's company, things are still unresolved. You ever have any of those kinds of arguments? Sure you have. And I want you to think about what the rest of your day is like when you have that unresolved. Isn't it the case that nothing seems to be right in any other part of your life? We're talking about the things that are going on in your job, every other interaction that you have with other people. Things just don't sit right with you. And you just feel like everything's just a little bit off. And until you can get to that moment where you can sit down with your spouse and you can iron out all the difficulties, it's just not going to be right. But on the other side of that, how does it feel when you have got everything resolved and all is at peace and all is in harmony? you might conclude by saying that life could not get much better than that on this earth. And I think I understand why that is, and that's because the marriage relationship is the most intimate of earthly relationships that we have. To really appreciate this, all we need to do is look at the imagery that the Lord through Paul is trying to give us. When he wants us to appreciate the closeness of the relationship that Christ and his church is to have with one another, he illustrates it with the marriage relationship, the husband and the wife in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 through 34. Now there's a big difference between the marriage relationship that you and your spouse have if you're married and the relationship that the church has with Christ. In that earthly relationship, both the husband and wife have weaknesses and flaws and shortcomings, and they bring that together in that relationship. But in the relationship that we have with God, it's different, at least on one side. For our part, there are weaknesses and there are flaws and shortcomings that we bring into that relationship. But on God's side, God is never more than He should be. He is never less than He should be. And yet he relates with us and wants to be in a relationship with us. And when it comes to the relationship that we are having, building, and are in with God, we either can assess that by saying that we feel like we're at odds with him. And if that's the case, things shouldn't feel right. But if things are right with God, there's no feeling like it that you can have in any relationship that you'll ever have. I find it interesting that in the prophets there are a couple of them that speak about the future, a future time of restoration, a time of peace. And these particular prophets will use similar language to describe those times. They'll either, as Zechariah does, will talk about in that day. At the end of his prophecy, he looks ahead to the time of Christ, the Messianic age. They didn't know at the time as they're writing according to Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1, but they were looking ahead at the time that we can look back at and see as the time of the new covenant. And Jeremiah is another prophet, perhaps a little bit more unexpectedly, that Jeremiah would come along and he would speak about at that time in those days. Because when you think about Jeremiah, you think about the weeping prophets. You think about a prophecy, if you know about Jeremiah, he's writing to the southern kingdom of Judah. They're turning away from him, and their iniquity is growing. And as the result of this, God determines through Jeremiah that they're going to go into Babylonian captivity. It's going to be terrible. He, he writes a very graphic picture of the punishment that's coming because of the disobedience of the people of God. 
And yet when we get toward the, the last third of that book, you find a glimpse into the future. In those days, Jeremiah chapter 30, a time when there would be restoration, a time when there would be hope, and it would be characterized by safety and freedom and being led and being guided and being restored and being reconciled. And so he anticipates that greater time, that time of reconciliation. And then in Jeremiah chapter 31, he talks about at that time, and that time we understand to be the time of the new covenant. How do we know that Jeremiah, in the, in the verses that Easton read so well a moment ago, how do we know that that's referring not just to their return from Babylon, but to the time of the new covenant? Because New Testament writers who are led by the Spirit of God, they take that, that language in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, and they apply it to Christ in the church. The relationship that you and I can have today with Christ. For example, in Romans chapter 11 and verse 27, Paul talks about the covenant that he was going to have when he takes away their sins. In fact, if you look at the Hebrews writer who seems to be quoting from the Greek Old Testament, in Hebrews chapter 8 he says, there's going to come a time in the future days when I'm going to make a covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Jacob, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day in which I brought them out of the land of Egypt by the hand, and they did not keep my commandments and I did not care for them. But in that day there's going to be a covenant which I will write on their minds and on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no man will say to his neighbor or to his brother to follow the Lord, for they'll not need to be that. They'll not need to be taught. But I will write it on their hearts and on their minds. And they will know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. And in that time, I will remove their iniquity and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. And again in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16 and 17, the Hebrews writer quotes the last part of Jeremiah 31 and applies it to what we have in Jesus Christ. I say all that to say that what Jeremiah is depicting here is a beautiful picture of what life is like when things are right with God. I think a Sunday night crowd is going to be composed of those who are very serious about the relationship that they have with God. You want to do whatever you can do to be able to build on and be more intimate in that relationship with God. And what I want us to do for just a few moments is to look and to see some of the characteristics of what life is like when we're right with God. Number one, when we are right with God, we enjoy fellowship with Him. In Jeremiah 31 and verse 1, Jeremiah leads out by saying that I will be their God and they shall be my people. Now those who are reading this, he says all the families of Israel there in Jeremiah 31 and verse 1, if you're reading Jeremiah's prophecy and you see that, what you're going to think about is Abraham's descendants. You're going to think about the Jews. And that's certainly true that there is an immediate context in which Jeremiah's readers want to know what life is going to be like when they get back from Babylon. They're going to be there for almost a century. What will it be like when they get back home? But because we know that this has application most fully in the days of Christ, there's more at play here. In fact, the New Testament speaks about the true Israel of God. You may remember that this morning at Hiram and speaking of the blessings of Christ went to Galatians chapter 3 verse 26 through 29. I want to visit that again and listen to what the Apostle Paul says. He says, For we are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus, for as many of us have been baptized into Christ and put on Christ. And there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, but you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Abraham's seed, then you are heirs according to the promise. You belong to Christ. Who is Abraham's seed today? Who follows his example of faith? It's those who have faith in Jesus as God's Son and those who have been baptized into Christ. In Romans chapter 2 verse 28 and 29, the Apostle Paul says, who's a true Jew? Who is the one that is rightfully so today? It's the one who has had their hearts circumcised by the Holy Spirit of God. And so Jeremiah is painting for us this intimate picture of fellowship that follows when things are right with God. Jeremiah says, I want you to look ahead and see that when we're right with one another, you have this intimate fellowship. 
And when we get to the days of the early church, you'll find this over and over again, this concept, this precept. John says in 1 John 1 and verse 3, That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, so that your fellowship may be with us. And our fellowship truly is with God and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Fellowship, a close association that is the result of mutual interests and a common bond. When you think about that, what we see with fellowship with God is this ability for us to be able to join our purpose with His. Isn't it wonderful for us to look and see that this purpose that we have is a purpose that's exalted? It's a purpose that God has given to us. When we surrendered our will and we submitted to His Word and His will for our lives, what we said is, is I'm renouncing self and selfish interests, and as the result of this, I'm going to follow in in God's mission. I'm going to do what He wants. Isn't it wonderful? when you realize that your life is aligned in purpose with the purpose that He's given for you, when you can look into your life and see that you're striving to be partners with Him and the very reason that He has us here on this earth, that everything else is a means to an end that we're seeking to accomplish His purpose. And so we see that we have the ability to have fellowship with His Son, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9. John says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanses us from all sins. Now, at the time that Jeremiah's readers are reading this, they don't have that sense or that feeling of fellowship. What they feel is a growing distance between themselves and God because of the lifestyle and the choices that they have made. They can't grasp at this time. Jeremiah's pointing to a time in which that would be better for them. And I suggest to you that that's a good thing when it happens in our lives. If we're not seeking the will of God, if we're not joining with Him in His purpose, then there ought to be this nagging feeling when there's distance between us and God. Nothing else in our life should feel right when we're far away from Him. But the feeling that we get when that's the case should draw us to want to be common in our interest with Him, to come back with Him, to span the distance that exists. That phrase, I will be their God and they shall be my people, is a thread that runs throughout the New Testament. It's a picture of how one who is right with God feels that sense of enjoying that fellowship with Him. Paul says sometimes it comes at a great price. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 16, when we say no to the fellowship of this world, when we're not trying to serve its purpose and its direction, Paul says there's no agreement with the temple of God and idols. He says you're a temple of the living God. As God has said, I will walk in them and I will dwell in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Or when we embrace the promise of Christ in Hebrews 8 and verse 10 and we understand that covenant is for us to be able to be one in purpose with Him or when we look ahead past this life into the eternal life. John says this in Revelation 21 and verse 3. He says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men and God will dwell among them and they shall be His people and God Himself shall be with them. What is life like when it's right with God? We enjoy fellowship with Him. We feel like we're pulling in the same direction of God. We have a common interest. And knowing that our interest is what His interest is makes that a close relationship. When life is right with God, we also experience His grace. In Jeremiah 31 and verse 2, Jeremiah talks about those who had escaped the sword and survived in the wilderness. They found grace when they sought His rest. I find it interesting that there are two different word pictures that seem to be depicted here by Jeremiah. One is of a people who were facing the certainty of death, but they have survived that sword. The second picture is of a weary people who are seeking for rest. Now, they were looking for rest, and when they went searching for that, what they found was something even greater than that. They found God's grace. I don't know, and it's funny, I believe this is their real names, John and Mary. 
John and Mary, about 10 years ago, were out walking with their Irish setter in a place they always walk on their large rural California property. And as they had walked down a path that they had been walking for many years, they happened to see a little rusty can on the side of the road. And as they looked on that path and they saw that can, they pulled it up. And as they began to dig through the contents of that can, they noticed that there were several gold coins in perfect condition. Minted between 1847 and 1894. The face value alone on those coins was $28,000. But then they began to farm it out to experts in the field and they sold this particular can of coins all together for $10 million. You know, when you think about this, this, the Saddle Ridge Hoard, the largest gold find of treasure in the United States history by a private party. You might think, well, that's just something that happens all the way across the country in California. I don't know if you heard about this one. This one happened last year. There was a fellow in a cornfield. All I can find out is it's nearby. It might be in Bowling Green. It might be in western Kentucky. I don't know. He doesn't want to be. You, you understand why. He doesn't want to be known. But he was out digging in that cornfield, and he found a can with 800 Civil War era coins. 700 of them were gold coins. They were minted between 1854 and 1863. The best guess was that this was in advance of Morgan's Raiders, and so it was hidden on this property, and they dug it up, and they sold it to a site called Gov Mint for $2 million. And isn't it interesting that as they're walking along, they're not even looking for it, and they found something greater than they might have anticipated. Jeremiah is talking about a people who are in the wilderness. And in the wilderness wandering, they just want food and they want water. They just want to survive. The picture is of something that's arduous and that seems not to come to an end. And yet, as they escape the sword, they find grace. Grace is something that we typically think of as a New Testament principle. And it's true. The word grace is only found 66 times in the Old Testament. We're talking about something that's so great, it's impossible for us to place a value on it. And Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31 and verse 3, is one of three usages in the prophets in which the word is translated grace. In Nahum 3 and verse 4, it's charming, but there are only two prophets that translate it grace. That's Jeremiah and Zechariah. And I find that interesting because they're pointing ahead to that time, to the time of the New Testament. Because John will say later on in John 1 and verse 17 that the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Christ. When things are right with God, we appreciate His loving favor, His undeserved favor. We can't earn it or merit it. But when we go searching for Him, we find grace, something far greater than we ever could anticipate. When things are right with God, we experience His grace. Over two specific concentration camps in Europe, there were over Auschwitz and Dachau, there was a sign, three German words translate into four English words. Work makes you free. If you read about the concentration camps, you realize that that was a lie. That was a false hope. Many of the people who got on the trains and they went out into these concentration camps thought that they were just going to try to work. And if they could show their value, then they would stay alive. And so they worked. Sometimes they worked so hard just to keep from being put to death. And yet there was no emancipation through their work. There was only death. What we come to appreciate through Jesus Christ is that there's not going to be any work that we do that emancipates us. It's going to be through by grace through faith, Ephesians 2, verse 8 and verse 9. When things are right with God, we experience His grace. We understand our dependency, our reliance upon that grace. When things are right with God... We are drawn by His love. I love what God says, the Lord says to him who is afar, that I have loved him with an everlasting love. I have drawn him with loving kindness. Here in Jeremiah 31, in verse uh, 3, we have this idea of God drawing us with His love. When things are right with God, we come to appreciate how much He loves us. We come to see that He loves us. You know, there's nothing more important than knowing that God loves us. 
There's nothing more important than to know that your father loves you. The National Center for Fathering said something that they believe to be true as a very exhaustive survey in which they found that only 3 to 4% of fathers are reported to tell their children, I love you on a consistent basis, to audibleize it. I don't mean that they prove it by the things that they do, but to actually use the words 3 to 4%. And there's a lot of different excuses given for why that that is. Maybe I grew up in a home where I didn't hear it very much. I'm not very comfortable with that. I find other ways to express my love. But I believe they're right when they say that there's nothing more important when it's said sincerely and it's backed up by behaviors that when we tell our children we love them on a regular basis, it gives them support and encouragement and tenderness and caring that they need as much as anything else in their lives. When we understand that our Father loves us, it can make all the difference in our functionality versus our dysfunction. How do we know that God loves us? We can look around and we can see all kind of proof. We can see demonstrations of His love. But isn't it a remarkable thing that though it's certainly true, as true as of our Heavenly Father as of any other being, that God doesn't leave it to chance? How often does God say, I love you? I mean, you read the scriptures and over and over again, He is making sure that we understand that He loves us. Yes, you can look at the cross and you can see proof positive of that, but even on that occasion when Jesus is referring ahead to the cross in the golden text of the Bible, He speaks to Nicodemus and He says He audibilizes God's love. When we see God's love as it's depicted in John chapter 3 and verse 16, we see the measurements of God's love. What does he say? For God so loved. This speaks of limits and of extents and of measurements. I think of Ephesians chapter 3 verse 17 through 19. To know the love of Christ that passes knowledge, that we might be filled with all the fullness of God, that we can understand the breadth and the length and the height and the depth. When we think about the breadth of God's love, it extends to people of every race and every class and of every nation. When we think about the length of God's love, it goes from everlasting to everlasting, and as John 13, 1 says, to the very end. When we think about the depth of God's love, it reaches to people in the very lowest levels of life and the very lowest levels of sin, even the chief of sinners, 1 Timothy 1 and verse 15. And we think about the height of God's love. We realize that He's caused us to sit in heavenly places. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 and 6. He's made us kings and priests for Revelation 1, 5 and 6. We see the measurements of God's love. We see the object of God's love. For God so loved the world. We see the sacrifice of divine love that He gave His only begotten Son. We see the impartiality of God's love that whosoever, we see the conditions of God's love that whosoever believes on Him and we see the blessings of divine love should not perish but have everlasting life. No wonder John would say, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it didn't know Him. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. When things are right with God, we are drawn by His love. We see it as it is. And being drawn, we want to be in a relationship with a God who loves so perfectly. But when things are right with God, we feel genuine joy. This is a remarkable thing that happens here because you look at verse 4 and 5 and verse 9 through 16, there's definitely joy to come. There's going to be tambourines and there's going to be dancing and there's going to be shouts. And yet as Jeremiah speaks of this in this part of the chapter, he says that they're coming before him with mourning and crying and tears and sorrow. And it's a reminder that so often the way to joy in our spiritual life may have to go through the channels of sorrow. In 2 Corinthians 7, 9 and 10, Paul is talking to the church at Corinth, a church that has repented of some of the things that he wrote him about in the first Corinthian letter. And in that second letter, we see that godly sorrow brought them to a place where they didn't have to be sorrowful anymore. When things are right with God, we may have to put away some things that aren't right, but on the other side of that, there's genuine joy. Just ask David, Create in me a clean heart, O God, 
and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, O Lord, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation and renew a right spirit, or uphold me with your willing spirit. You see, when things are right with God, there's a joy that cannot be found in anything else in life. It was in 2010... It was a Minnesota family, and they found themselves facing foreclosure. The house that they owned was going into foreclosure, and in fact, it was so close in the process that they were already cleaning out their things. And so as they were going throughout the house, they went down into the basement, and in the basement, they found a comic book. It happened to be the first comic book that Superman ever appeared in. If you're a comic book nerd, it's Action uh, uh, Comics number 1, June 1938. They found this magazine. Apparently it was the wife's father's and he had had it in his collection in a box and he passed it along to his daughter and there it was. In 2008, they had taken out a second mortgage on their house to start a business. Unfortunately, 2009 followed 2008 and in the dot-com collapse, they went belly up in their business and now this comic book that her dad bought for a dime was sold for $438,000 and it saved the family. Superman saved the day. When you think about joy, joy is so often measured by the distance between the before and the after. They went from foreclosure to fortune. And Jeremiah is talking about what was to come, what they faced in this close relationship with God, this genuine joy that they felt was going to be because of the change that takes place, the restoration, the peace, and the confidence that came after that. What's life like before we're right with God? Paul writes in that letter we looked at this morning in Ephesians chapter 2, and at that time you were separate from Christ, you were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, you separated from God, you had no hope, and you were without Christ in this world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were afar off are made near by the blood of Christ. Aren't we thankful for all of those spiritual blessings that uh, Hiram showed us this morning from Ephesians chapter 1? It's a joy that comes because we're right with God. He made us right with Him. And Jeremiah is looking ahead to that. It's something we can look out at today because Christ has come. When things are right with God, we have genuine joy. When things are right with God, we also need to worship. Jeremiah is going to project into the future in Jeremiah 31, verse 6 through 8. And as he does, he's going to talk about a time when they go on the hills of Ephraim and they're going to shout out and they're going to, 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 to talk to one another and they're going to tell one another, come and praise the Lord, come into Zion, come into the house of the Lord. He's going to praise Him because of who He is. And he's talking about coming back from this time of captivity in which you're going to have the blind and the lame and the woman who's with child and the woman who is giving birth coming together from the far country back home. They're calling to one another. When things are right with God, they are saying to each other, let's go and let's worship God. Let's give Him the praise. Let's sing to Him in the way that He's worthy of. And I suggest to you that when things are right with God in our lives, nothing can keep us from coming and being with Him, certainly publicly. You think about in a time in your life when things were not right. You really kind of started losing your interest in coming together in worship, didn't you? It's, it's just a part of it. And, and maybe it wasn't very difficult for you to rationalize. I'm going to be somewhere else at this time. And, and maybe it was something you told yourself was very important. Or maybe... You improperly prioritized. And maybe you stayed on that track long enough that you got to the point where you stopped coming and you really stopped feeling the pain of, of being away from God's people. But when things are right with God, there is nothing that can keep you from coming in the assemblies with others and bowing before the great I Am. But let me suggest one other thing with regard to this. That while that may be a, something that comes, the Hebrews writer warns about this in Hebrews 10 and verse 25, where we abandon the assemblies, it begins on a much more intimate level in our own personal relationship with God. Isn't it true that when things are right with God, you can't wait to get into His throne room? You can't wait to pray to Him? You can't wait to worship Him? You can't wait to listen to what He has to say in His Word? But if you're not in His Word... <laughs> 
If you're not appealing to Him in prayer, you're in the process of things not being right between you and Him, and that distance will grow. And whether or not it shows up in the public assemblies, we're not right with Him when we have no intimate fellowship of worship with Him. But when things are right with Him, nothing can keep us from becoming before the great I Am. When things are right with God, we have hope for the future. In verse 17 through 24, Jeremiah comes right out and he says that. At that time, in that day, there'll be a hope for your future when you come back into the land. Now, I want you to understand that at the time that he's talking about, there's going to already be a, a time of reconciliation. Ephraim will have already grieved, verse 18 and 19. And so what follows that? There's going to be a restoration that follows that. They're going to be restored to the land, restored in their relationship with God, verse 18 and verse 23. There's going to be a time of refreshment. As we see in verse 25, when God is going to refresh them, there's going to be a time of rebuilding when He will build and He will plant. Verse 28, there's going to be a time of reconciliation in this time when the new covenant is going to come, verse 31 through 33, there's going to be a time of redemption. It's going to come, verse 34, when he remembers their sins no more. And there's going to be a time when there is a renewed hope for the future. Because it's going to be based on the foundation of God's character, verse 35 through 40, and the foundation of God stands sure. We can trust it, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19. When things are right with God, it doesn't matter what we're going through in this life. It doesn't matter how difficult things are for us because we have hope of something better. You know, on one occasion, the Apostle Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That means if I die, I get to go and be with Jesus. If I live, Jesus will come and be with me. But either way, we're together, and I have a hope that will help me through any difficulty that I face the most difficult times. Frank Graff wrote one of my favorite songs, Does Jesus Care? And he depicts four common scenarios, sorrow, fear, failure, and death. And he reassures us that no matter what happens, that our Savior cares. And because he does, no matter how many dark days we spend in the valley, there's light at the end of the tunnel, and there's a mountaintop that we never have to leave at the end of it. I don't know if you know this or not, but there was an alternate award for about 10 years to the Nobel Peace Prize called the Confucius Peace Prize. The Chinese brought this award out and, and they awarded it to various individuals. The various recipients of that included Vladimir Putin, 2011, Fidel Castro, 2014, Robert Mugabe, 2015. I mean, these peace loving guys are responsible for millions of deaths and untold destruction. It reminds me of something we read earlier in Jeremiah's prophecy when he condemns those who cry, peace, peace, when there is no peace. It's good for us to acknowledge that we can think things are right with God when they're really not right with God. If we go to some other source than the Word of God to tell us about our relationship with God, we may think everything is as it should be. But what Jeremiah is talking about in Jeremiah 31 is a peace that's true peace. It's a peace built on what God tells us that it is. And that's a peace that's available to all of us. It's an assurance, a confidence that we have when we walk in the light. When we think about the peace that's available, we think about that being synonymous with things being right with God. And what is life like when things are right with God? We enjoy fellowship with Him. We experience his grace. When we think about our God and our relationship with Him, we come to understand that through things being right with God, we are drawn by His love and we feel genuine joy. We can't wait to be in His presence to worship Him. And no matter what things are like in our present, we always have hope for a future that is bright as the promises of God. And of course, the question is, as we sometimes sing, I don't know if it's in the plans to sing tonight, is our heart right with God? How do we know if our life is right with Him? We see His Word, and He tells us. He's made it plain and clear for us. He's told us how we get right with Him. The plan of salvation that we always uh, reveal and share at the end of these lessons is to remind us that God has made a way for us to be reconciled with Him. 
by acting on faith and that great sacrifice, that grace that we've been talking about tonight that leads us to repent and be baptized. It's available to us. We can get right with God and we can stay right with Him. No matter what uncertainties we face this week and in our lives right now, we can be right with Him. And that makes everything that we endure something that we can successfully overcome. But when we're tripped up by the things of this life and we take our eyes off of our relationship with God, we can always come back to Him. We can always go from the darkness back into the light. But if there's a need we have publicly to share with others, Galatians 6 and verse 2 says that we're to bear one another's burdens and in that way fulfill the law of Christ. Maybe we can help you with something that you're struggling with tonight. If we can, we'll wait for you here now as together we stand and sing.